the welcome to the educational session on the draft ESRS E5 resource use and circular economy. I would like to start with a quotation from the EU circular economy action plan. In the introduction, it states there is only one planet Earth, yet by 2050, the world will be consuming as if there were three. Global consumption of materials such as biomass, fossil fuels, metals and minerals is expected to double in the next 40 years, while annual waste generation is projected to increase by 70% by 2050, <clears throat> which gives the ambition of the EU in terms of circular economy and resource use. And we'll see in the EU legal framework more specifically on the sustainable uh, finance in the EU which is also reflected in the, the CSRD. There is this emphasis on resource use and circular economy. We can also find two SFDR principal adverse um, indicators on hazardous waste and radioactive waste ratio and the non recycled waste ratio, which is required. And it's also an important uh, part of uh, the taxonomy regulation. Uh, with one of the six objectives being uh, dedicated to resource use and circular economy. Hence, this draft ESRS E5, which is really in the wake of this um, EU policy uh, framework. The objective of the standard is to clarify how the undertaking affects resource use in terms of positive and negative material actual and potential impact, the actions taken and the result of such action to prevent, mitigate or remediate actual or potential material negative impact, the plans and capacity of the undertaking to adapt its strategy and uh, elements around the nature, type and extent of the undertaking's material risk and opportunities <clears throat> related to the undertaking's impact and dependencies arising from resource use and circular economy. And finally, there is uh, this uh, objective of understanding what are the financial effects on the undertaking. So the first section is about impact, risk and opportunities management. It really has to be understood and read um, in conjunction with ESRS 2, which states how to lead and describe the process to identify and assess material um, impact, risk and opportunities, and add uh, some information in relation to resource use and circular economy. In particular, to lead this materiality assessment, there is a clear link in a consistent manner with all other environmental standards, except for climate, with the LEAP approach that is also inspired uh, by the TNFD frameworks with matters to be considered for the location in terms of contribution to impact drivers and dependencies on ecosystem services and the location areas at risk. So it's sometimes a bit more tricky to understand for resource use and circular economy, but we can think about, for instance, um, dependencies on some materials and some resources where it's obvious that the location is a key important is of key importance and in terms of outflows it may also be relevant for instance uh, the waste treatment challenges are obviously not the same depending on the areas where the uh, production and operation for in, in industrial companies uh, take place with some countries where waste treatment can be more efficient than in other or some even some areas. Uh, in terms of uh, then we when we have uh, led the location phase, there is the evaluation of the impacts and the dependencies. Then the assessment of the risk and opportunities with um, the possibility to consider life cycle assessment and other tools, including the organizational environmental footprint and the product environmental footprint. Um, and uh, finally, for the preparation, the possible outcome of the material um, assessment may include a list of business units um, and products associated to resource use and circular economy, a list and prioritization of the material resources used by the undertaking, and the material impact and risk of staying in business as usual in what we could call a linear economy uh, compared to the opportunities related to moving and transitioning to a circular economy. Uh, this is obviously um, quite systematic uh, and comprehensive. 
So now, if we move to policies, actions and resources, what um, is really important to have in mind is the policies have to be disclosed only in relation to the resource use and circular economy related impact, risk and opportunities. Only those policies that are in relation to material IROs have to be disclosed. The undertaking should then indicate whether and how the policies that it has implemented address the following matters. Transitioning away from extraction of virgin non-renewable resources and securing and contributing to the regenerative production of renewable resources and the regeneration of ecosystems they are part of. Of course, there can be other policies that can be described. If we move now to actions and resources related to resource use and circular economy, it's the same articulation as for policies. They only have to be disclosed when in relation to material arrows and to the policies that have been implemented. And the undertaking should specify whether and how an action and resources cover any of the layers of the waste hierarchy that you can see here. <clears throat> More detailed circular economy strategy throughout the value chain of the project, starting with refuse, rethink, reduce, reuse, repair, refurbish, remanufacture, and repurpose and recycle. And a description of the actions, including circularity measures taken to prevent waste generation in the undertaking's value chain and to manage material impact. Because waste um, often requires uh, collective action, it is really um, important for the undertaking to also consider if uh, they have taken collective action and to specify those actions and how they engaged with their local uh, ecosystem and the development of collaborations. Let's move now to metrics and targets. So first and targets, uh, the targets related to resource use and circular economy follow again the same architectures as the policies, as the actions and resources and have to be disclosed when regarding and addressing material arrows only. No targets should be disclosed on a subtopic or um, on a matter which is not material. Then the targets should indicate whether and how they relate to the following list of items you see here. Um, and the undertaking should also consider if ecological and entity specific thresholds were taken into consideration when setting the targets. This refers to the CSRD, which requires that environmental targets must uh, be linked with scientific evidence. Um, and so the undertaking should specify how those ecological thresholds were identified. identified. We can think, for instance, of pollution um, of uh, plastic and the uh, planetary boundaries. In the present case, it may, it may be a bit more tricky than for, for instance, water or biodiversity, where the, the planetary boundaries are easier to link to some local aspects. But uh, the link here may also be quite high level um, when uh, more relevant. If we move to metrics, so the first disclosure requirement, if I fall, is around resource inflow. So the undertaking shall disclose information on its material resource inflows and provide a description of its material inflows in its own operation and along the value chain on products and materials, including packaging and uh, property plant and equipment. Uh, and then for certain undertakings for which inflows or material and or those active in one of the key products value chain, which is described in the EU Circular Economy Action Plan, which you can find at the bottom, electronics and ICT, batteries and vehicles, packagings, plastics, textiles, construction and buildings, and food, water and nutrients. So for all undertakings active in one of those uh, areas, value chain, there is also to be included some quantitative information. The overall total weight of products and materials used during the reporting period, 
the weight in absolute value and percentage of renewable input materials from regenerative sources and the weight in both absolute value and percentage of reused or recycled products and materials used to manufacture the undertakings, products and services. Important to understand that this includes packaging. And um, as for all disclosure requirements, it's important to inform on the methodology used to calculate the data, including whether the data is sourced from direct measurement or estimations, uh, and disclose the key assumptions used. <clears throat> If we move to resources outflows, it's really the parallel to what we just saw on inflows regarding products and materials. So there is a, a qualitative description of the key products and materials that come out of the undertakings production process and how they were designed along the value chain through circular principles, durability, reusability, reparability, Display, disassembly, sorry, remanufacturing, refurbishing, recycling, or other optimization. And then for the same list <clears throat> of sectors, the undertaking should also include some quantitative information. The second part of resource outflows is in relation to waste. So the undertaking shall disclose the following information on its total amount of waste, on its own operation um, at the reporting period in tons or kilogram, the total amount of waste. And then for each type of hazardous and non-hazardous waste, um, the amount by weight diverted from disposal and the amount by weight uh, directed to disposal by recovery operation and waste treatment respectively. When disclosing the composition of the waste, we would also uh, require the undertaking to specify a certain number of elements, the waste streams, the materials that are present in the waste, um, and also, and this is a SFDR PAA, uh, same as the total amount and percentage of non-recycled waste. And then there are two SFDR PAI. So the first one is the total amount and percentage of non-recycled waste. And the second one is the total amount of hazardous waste and radioactive waste generated by the undertaking. This information, again, has to be accompanied by contextual information on methodologies and exceptions. The last disclosure requirement is about the potential financial effects. Here again, it's the same um, disclosure requirement as for all environmental topics from ESRS E1 to E5, with no specific information uh, required in relation to ESRS E5. The objective is really to understand how um, the risk in relation to resource use and circular economy have a material influence on the undertaking's cash flows, performance, position, development, cost of capital, or access to finance over the short, medium, and long-term uh, horizon, or how the undertaking may financially benefit um, from opportunities. And in terms of information, so you, it is important to understand that there is a transitional provision of three years to provide quantitative information. Um, and so the information to be required is the, so the quantification um, with no mandatory disclosure in the first three years of the potential financial effects in monetary terms. Even after the first three years, the undertaking uh, may provide rather qualitative information, a single amount or a range where it's impracticable to provide a quantification. There is also a description of the effects considered to be disclosed and the critical assumptions used. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I hope it uh, has helped you to better understand um, the structure, architecture and requirement of ESAS E5. Thank you.